Graduations uh, are interesting because what happens is we have, uh, the pastors have weekly meetings, um, not just with, not just amongst the EM pastors, but we meet with the camp pastors as well. And so uh, we, we kind of sit around uh, the senior pastor's desk, Pastor Moon's desk, and um, I only understand, understand about 25% what happens in the communication process because he speaks in Korean. But uh, I understand his tone, right? Because tone communicates a lot. And then, uh, and then a few weeks ago, he says, hey, we're going to have a graduation service. It's plugged into the calendar. And he looks at me, and he says, hey, you're going to preach for the 1130 KM service. We're going to have a graduation celebration and all that stuff. And so, and so when we receive that, there's like, I don't know, three seconds of pause where we have to like kind of internalize. Okay, what does that mean, right? What are we doing? Because for me, it's a little bit unique. Because in the KM side, uh, it, they value family. Not that we don't, but they have family. And so when we have an 11.30 KM service, the parents want to see their graduates recognized in the church, right, and do the whole celebration thing, and it's nice, right? We don't have any families in here, apart from Pastor Josh, right? And so for us, it's like, what is graduation? I kind of have to be in that awkward position as an EM pastor with young people, no married couples or families. What is graduation. And so I'm thinking about that. And it's not like I'm going to say I'm not going to do it because I've come to the realization that even though it's a little bit confusing for us, I still think it's really important. And and the reason I think it's important is because it's not just an academic thing like you graduated from college or grad school. It's not just that. But I think it is also a deeply spiritual thing. Where in the Bible do we see graduations? To my knowledge, none. But I think in part it's important because it creates milestones. It creates spiritual milestones for us. A milestone is a quick quick snapshot uh, to capture a moment where you can go back to that 5, 10, 20, 50 years from now and say, that was a milestone in my life. It's an identifiable time when I moved from point A to point B. Spiritually speaking, it's a time where you can distinctively say this was a time when God was doing something in my life. And so graduations are like milestones. And so think about that for a second. What are the major milestones in your life? What are the major spiritual milestones in your life? I almost flunked first grade, okay? I'm not stupid, but I was stupid. I almost flunked first grade, and I distinctly remember my mom sitting me down in in such a loving and sweet and gracious way, telling me how important my future is. And see, the thing is, she didn't do that. She whipped my butt, okay? None of that is true. She whipped my butt. She gave me the butt whipping of a lifetime, okay? And, and, And she instilled in me the fear of mother, Okay, there's fear of God and then there's fear of mother, like just a close second place. You know what I'm saying? And, and that fear instilled in me something. And I distinctly remember receiving that right after that, just that that crazy storm, dark storm of mother, just the wrath of a rock in my life. And I remember sitting there by myself thinking, man, you know, mom's right. You got to get your act together. You're almost in second grade, bro. You got to man up. <laughs> You know, you got to get your act together. What's going on, right? And I started getting, you know, straight A's after that and all that stuff, right? That was a milestone in my life, right? That shaped me into the man I am today, believe it or not. Another milestone in my life, high school graduation. Yeah, not really. I didn't care about that. College graduation, on the other hand, was a major milestone in my life because I faced some deep spiritual darkness in my college years, um, and, and some of you kind of may know a little bit of my testimony in that, but that was a big milestone in my life because I can go back to that period in time and say how hard and difficult and dark that was, but God pulled me out of that. And I learned some invaluable things. Nine months ago, I was ordained. That was a major milestone in my life. And I distinctly remember sitting with all the... Uh, uh, um, uh, ordination candidates, and we're weeping in the worship, not because it was such a great worship song, but because we're recollecting how good God is that he would call a bunch of jacked up people to ministry. That was so powerful for me, and I'll never forget that for the rest of my life because that was a milestone. And so 
That's what I mean by milestone. And if graduation is about creating milestones in your life, then how does a Christian specifically create spiritual milestones? There are clear things that every Christian will go through in life. I mean, if you are a, a real Christian and you are confident in your salvation, then the moment of season when you accepted Christ, that will forever be, for eternity, that will be a milestone. Even when you're in heaven, in this distant and faint time, you're like, remember back when we were like, you know, still sinners and we're still in the regeneration process and we're not in heaven yet? Remember that that retreat when I accepted Christ? Remember that season when God was calling me to repentance? You're going to remember that for the rest of your life. That's a milestone. When you were baptized and when you were confirmed, that for eternity will be a milestone that you remember. But after that, what happens? You're a Christian for five years, 10 years, 20 years. You don't get a certificate. Okay, we don't do that at our church, you know what I'm saying? If you're a Christian for 10 years, I'm not going to call you up and give you a medal or something like that. Like, that, no one does that. You're a Christian for 50 years. Nothing is there to recognize how much you've come in your Christian faith. And so at that point, okay, what do we do? How do we create spiritual milestones? Um, I think in one sense, a Christian actually does have spiritual milestones because it's not like the world's milestones, but they're actually defined by dark spiritual depression. Why am I talking about spiritual depression for a graduation sermon? When the senior pastor said that I'm going to be preaching in the came graduation service, I was going to preach on this. I was going to preach on Psalm 42. And then I realized in the middle of the week that I'm preaching to kids and I'm preaching to elderly and everyone in between. And I thought... This is a little bit dark for them. <laughs> I got to keep it light. I got to keep it broad. And so I preached on a different passage. But now I'm preaching to my people. And I'm specifically preaching to you graduates, Roy, Austin, Casey, Kenny, and Paul, and Claire, who is not here. I'm preaching to you guys because I want you to understand that at this point in your life, as you move forward, Maybe, maybe no one has ever, ever set you down and explained to you what the Christian life is like, but you're going to face some dark wildernesses in your life. You're going to face dark spiritual seasons. And, and they don't tell you this, but it's true. And the reason I'm sharing that is because this psalm is going to guide us through that spiritual darkness. And I'm preaching this to you because I want you to prepare for that spiritual darkness whenever it comes, so that when you look back on that, you can say with confidence, that was a milestone. I grew from that. It hurt. It sucked. It was dark. It was wilderness. But God brought me out of that. And if you're not prepared for that, some of you will go through that, and you're not going to recover. Not that, like, you'll die, okay? You're going to somehow recover, but it's going to be that much harder. So what is spiritual darkness? What am I talking about here? Verse 1 says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. So let's just think on that for a second. Uh, I think the more I meditate and think on this metaphor, the more I just keep extracting things. And, and, and apart from what I learned from books and commentaries, I don't know anything about deer, okay? Okay. I watched a documentary once called Bambi, and that really informed me what, what, what deer is, what deer are, or I don't know what, okay. But when I put into reality this deer panting for, for water, okay, I think Bambi is going on miles of journey, you know, and, and going through all kinds of terrain to finally find water. And so I'm thinking Bambi is panting, right? Bambi is, is, is really desperate for water, and I'm thinking, nice, right? Bambi found water, right? And so I'm thinking, okay, this is like me. What is this like for me for pant for water? I wake up in the middle of the night, especially these days, and I go to the refrigerator, you know, wanting to drink a glass of water and somehow end up downing a gallon of Powerade, right? That, that just happens, right? And I'm like, nice, how refreshing that is, right? And I think, oh, that's what Bambi is like, right? <laughs> As a deer pants for flowing streams. So my pant, so so my pant, so pants, so my pants, so pants my soul for you, O oh God. 
And so I'm thinking, nice, Bambi did it. And then that gets completely shattered in verse 2. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? So hear me when I say this, because this sets us up for the text. He looks to God. The psalmist here is creating a metaphor of a deer, and he's saying he looks to God, but he does not find God. That's what he's saying. When he says, my soul thirsts for God, he's really thirsting for God. Where in this text does it say that the deer found water? It just says it pants for it. And But why, right? Because when you read the Bible and you see people seeking out God's presence, aren't they supposed to find God? Isn't that what grace is about? Isn't that what the Bible is about? Isn't that about all these faithful men and women in the Bible, they're crying out for God and, and, and their soul is quenched by God? Isn't that what the Christian life is about? And so, and so what's going on here? This is spiritual depression. When you cry out for God and you don't feel his presence. So when you look at this, it doesn't seem like it's spiritual depression at first because you first see this metaphor and it's this peaceful deer, this Bambi kind of panting for water. And how do we know this is actually spiritual depression? He says in verse 3 that the only thing he's been eating is his tears. And he's eating his tears all day and all night. Why? Because he's weeping. And if he's eating his tears all day and all night, that means he's not sleeping. So he's not eating, and he's not sleeping. We call that depression. And, and during that process, during the season when you're going through depression and darkness and difficulty, the psalmist says he starts getting taunted. And, and you see, this is interesting because you see someone's taunting him, right? They're like, he says, they're like, where is your God, right? That's what they're saying. But the way the sentence is constructed is very interesting because in English, it just, it's a little confusing. Who is they? I mean, if you want to look at your Bibles to see what I'm talking about, I mean, go ahead. I mean, who is they? He says, they say to me all day long, right, where is your God? Who is they? Is it people or is it his tears? That's very interesting. What does it mean that your tears are taunting you? It means the voices in your head are telling you. Your own self, your own consciousness that narrative, that, that conversation in your head, you yourself are challenging yourself. If God really loves you, why are you going through this? Where's your God? And some of you, it's not a question of God's existence. You're too Christian to deny the existence of God. So for you, it's more like God exists, but he's abandoned you. You're here at church, you're doing your thing. Where is he? Where is he? Why are you going through this darkness? Why do you go to church and everybody just seems to be doing the same thing? Why, do, why does everyone just seem to understand something? Are they just faking it? Or am I the only one that doesn't get something? Because this sucks. I don't sense God's presence. So here's my big question for you. Can you pursue God even if you don't feel God's presence? Can you Pursue God, even in your spiritual apathy. Even when there is a darkness of the soul. My nieces now, um, they're no longer babies. They're three and a half years old now, so they're adults. And so I treat them like adults now. They walk around like they own the world. And, and so two weeks ago, for the first time, I had to watch them on my own. No other adult supervision. And so uh, I went into like a spiritual depression. God, what am I going to do with these nieces? No, I'm just kidding. But I'm nervous. And so I get to my sister's house and I'm watching these nieces. And so I have all this preparation. I have puzzles. I have Play-Doh. I have 10 different kinds of snacks. You know, I have, I have like games. I have like these all kinds of different toys and stuffed dolls. And I have a movie playing just in case, right? 
And they're literally jumping around for the first 10 minutes. Uncle Howie is here, and they're jumping around, and they're going crazy because they don't know what to do. And, and, then, and then for the, like, the rest of the hour, they just pop in front of the TV and watch stuff. But it's like they constantly need stimulation. That's the only way that works for them. I remember the more simple days when I would watch them, and all I needed literally was a pillow. And with a pillow, I could, I could watch them for hours because I just play peekaboo all day with these little munchkins. I just play peekaboo all day. What is peekaboo? I put the pillow in front of my head, right? And I move it and I go peekaboo, right? And then they love it. They go, ah, oh, right? And then when I hide my face, they literally freak out. Where, do, where is he? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Send out a rescue team. What's going on? Because they don't have the mental capacity to understand that I'm still there, right? I, I don't know what the technical word is, but the, the spatial understanding, they don't get it, right? And so I go peekaboo. Oh, thank God you're here. Oh my gosh, I was stressed out for a second. Where'd he go? <laughs> you know, and they freak out. And so instead of telling themselves, okay, wait, I just saw him a second ago, right? They can't rationalize, right? Is he behind that pillow? We're just going to have to wait and see. Like, they don't have <laughs> the mental capacity to do that, right? But now they do. When I try to pay peekaboo with them now, they just kind of stare at me like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Put on, put on Frozen already. Gosh, <laughs> stop wasting my time. You know what I'm saying? They're too mature for that because they're grown adults. Some of us have been Christian for years and we're still playing peekaboo with God. We've been Christian for years. We've been coming out to church for years. God hides his face and we freak out. Where is God? Like, we don't have the spiritual capacity to understand that God is playing a spiritual peekaboo with us to test our faith, to get us through the fire, to graduate us, to mature us. And what do we do? God is not here. I'm going to run away from this. I don't need this. And when that happens, we get stuck. We get apathetic. We get spiritually lazy. We do church, but it just becomes church, just motions. And so my question is, can you pursue God even if you don't see his face? Can you pursue God even if you don't feel his presence? This is what the psalmist is saying. I don't feel God's presence. I'm like a deer panting desperately for water. I don't feel God's presence, but this is what he says. But I refuse to give up. I'm not going to get lazy. I'm not going to get apathetic. I'm going to stay in the fight. This is what the psalm does. This is what the psalmist does. A lot going on here. I'm going to point out two things. Two things that the psalmist does to pursue God even when he doesn't feel God. First, he waits on God. The psalmist waits on God. Verse 5 says, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mizar. So when he says hope in God, that word for hope means to wait on God. It means to expect on God. So think about what hope means. It's not this vague, ambiguous just hope that I just hope something will turn better, but it's until God moves, until God delivers, until God stops playing peekaboo with me and it shows his face, I'm going to wait. I'm going to be steadfast. I'm going I'm to pursue him. I'm going to keep working out my faith until he shows up in my life. And you see, an issue that I struggle with as a pastor all the time Right? As, I'm, as I'm pursuing ministry and trying to be faithful at this pastoral thing, something I struggle with is that, is that I understand that the church caters to you. Right, That's good. The church caters to you. It's supposed to. Our job as pastors is to contextualize the gospel to you so that it's engaging, so it's exciting, so that it's fun, so that it's life-giving without compromising the truth. Right, And so the songs that we sing in worship, that's catered to you. If you don't know what that means, go to the 1130 KM service and you'll see what that means. To the KM service, that's catering to the KM. This is catering to you. When I preach and prepare a message, I'm thinking about you. I'm not trying to preach to 65-year-old, you know, retired men and women. I'm preaching to you. That's catering to you. Our budget, our retreats, our events, they're catering to you. And so, the struggle that I have with that is at what point do we stop catering? Or what, at what point do we cater less? At what point should we start expecting our members 
to start understanding what we're doing with the gospel and to start to catch on. Because what happens when you leave church on Sunday and then now six days out of the week you don't have church to cater to you? What happens? Do you just cease to be Christian for six days out of the week? I, I really wonder who, loved, who here loves Jesus enough that you're going to pursue Jesus solo apart from your, your main community on Sunday? Like, the, you can't realistically expect the church to cater to you six days out of the week. I mean, surely you must understand this, right? Surely you must understand that your small group is there the best that they can to support you. Surely you must understand that we're not just going to not have Sunday service. Surely you must understand that even though I'm not walking with every step of your life, I'm still your pastor. Surely you must understand that even through that, you still have a responsibility to walk solo with Jesus. Did you know that as important as community is, you're meant to pursue God on your own? You have to own up to your own personal faith. You see, that's what it means to wait on God. That in your own devotion and spiritual disciplines and Christian life, even when God is hiding his face from you, you can still open up the scriptures and still pursue God. I don't feel you, God, but I'm going to still go after you. I don't understand what's going on in my life of faith, but I'm going to trust that you're still behind that pillow, and I'm going to still go after you. And you're hoping, you're waiting, you're expecting God that he's going to finally uncover himself and reveal his presence to you. And, and, and if, for example, if, if you come to me and, and you're like, Pastor Howard, like, I need help, I need counseling, I don't know what's going on in my life. I can't feel God's presence. There's no spiritual excitement in my life. I just, I don't know what's going on. I'm just not excited for church, for worship, for anything. Everything's so bland. Everything is so just blah. Like, I don't know what to do. If you came to me and you shared that with me, at that point, okay, I'm not going to say, are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? You know, are, are, you, are, you, are you fasting? Are you giving your tithing or your offering? Are you active in your small groups? I'm not going to say that. Um, at that point, it's not about what you haven't done. At that point, it's about what you're going to do, what you're supposed to do. At that point, it's about what's going on with you. Let's identify that. But you should know now, before you go through a season of darkness, that you do actually need to read your Bible and that you do actually have to have a rigorous and robust prayer life. You have to start understanding that as you walk solo six days out of the week as a Christian, those lame, casual prayers, those routine prayers aren't going to work. And when you don't pray, and when you don't read your Bible, and you're not pursuing Jesus on your own, what you are doing as a Christian is you're shaking your puny little fist at God and saying, I dare you to challenge me. I dare you to put me through a spiritual darkness. You're not going to do it until the day that God actually does, and then you go, I don't know what to do. Graduates, you need to hear me when I say this. Now is the time to start preparing for that spiritual milestone. Hoping and waiting on God now will prepare you for later. So how do we do that? How do we hope and wait on God? So this is what's so crazy about this psalm. Um, the heading of your psalm, if you want to look at your Bibles, it should say, it should say something like, to the choir master, um, a mascal of the sons of Korah. And so, what in the world is that, right? What is the sons of Korah? The sons of Korah come out in random parts of the Bible. Uh, this guy, the psalmist, he's one of the sons of Korah, and he remembers when he and his people, at one point in their history, he's looking back, and he remembers that his people should have died. Um, the earth was literally swallowing up people, firing, fire was killing people, but the sons of Korah did not die. It's Numbers 26, 11. They come out in random parts of the Old Testament. And so even through the spiritual darkness, what's happening is this son of Korah, this guy, is remembering God's faithfulness. 
Okay, I don't have the time to spend, to go through this more thoroughly, but if you just kind of look at the nature of the text, he's remembering, he's worshiping, he's going back to this time and this place when he should have died. He literally should have died. But God delivered him. This little tiny verse, this little tiny verse that has grace all over it, God delivered them out of that catastrophe. And he's remembering the faithfulness and the grace of God. So think about this. All throughout this psalm, who is he talking to? He's not talking to a friend. There's nothing in this text about a friend. He's not talking to a congregation. There's nothing in this text about a people or congregation. He's talking to himself. In other words, he's, he's writing a lyric. He's writing a song. The Sons of Korah were professional musicians. They were writing a song. It's like he's opening up his journal to you, and he's saying, this is what's going on in a very honest way, my spiritual formation. And he's talking to himself. In other words, he is preaching to his heart. What do you call it when you preach yourself the message of grace? What do you call it when you preach to yourself that God saved you out of his loving kindness. It's called preaching the gospel. When you're in the darkness, when you're trying to sense God's presence and you can't find it, I need you to remember this. Graduates, non-graduates, I need you to remember this. Your community is here for you. Your small group is here for you. I'm here for you, but you cannot rely on those things. Preach the gospel to yourself. What it means to preach the gospel to yourself is this. You stop listening to your heart. Despite all the stupid fluff out there in the culture which says listen to your heart, I say that all the time. I'm in the drive through line of Jack and the Mike. What does your heart say, right? Despite all that stupid stuff, okay? Sometimes you have to pay attention to your emotions, but that not, that's not what this is about. Preaching the gospel to yourself means you're not listening to your heart, you're not listening to your heart, but you're telling your heart. You're proclaiming to your heart. You're grabbing a hold of your heart and you're saying, feelings aside, this is what you need to grasp onto. Preaching to your heart means feelings are important, but you need to stop and understand what is the objective truth of God here. How can I navigate myself through this darkness if the feelings are getting me nowhere? I feel like God isn't here. So does that mean that God is not here? Of course not. And so you have to remember truth and you have to pursue truth. Preaching is about proclaiming that truth into your soul. Preaching, listen to me, preaching is not counseling. As important as counseling is, preaching is not counseling. As important as small grouping is, preaching is not small grouping. As important as worshiping is, preaching is not worshiping. Preaching is proclaiming. It's grabbing a hold of your heart and saying, listen to me, you fickle thing. Before you hope in money, before you hope in relationships, before you hope in sex, before you hope in entertainment, before you fall deeper into spiritual apathy, hope in God. Get it down into your soul. But all we do is, well, that's Pastor Howard's job, once a week. Where will that lead you, church? Being a Christian one day out of the week, where is that going to lead you? How do we preach the gospel? The psalmist is calling himself the deer. And he says, when the deer thirsts, what eventually happens? Well, the deer will find its source and he'll be refreshed. And he says, hope in God and you'll find your salvation again. That's what he says, right? As you preach to yourself, God will eventually show himself and you'll find that living water and you'll be quenched. What is the gospel that the son of Kor doesn't yet know? As he's preaching the gospel to his art, what, is he, what does he not understand? He doesn't know that generations later, God would send someone who would thirst for God, but instead of finding a flowing stream, he finds a desert. He's not aware of that yet. The psalmist doesn't, doesn't know that, that generations later, God would send someone who would die on the cross and others would taunt him saying, where is your God? He doesn't know that yet. The psalmist doesn't know that generations later, God would send someone who would face the deepest and most intense spiritual darkness but still pursue God in perfect obedience. 
Church, we have Jesus who, who on our behalf thirsted until he died. We have Jesus who on our behalf cried all day and all night. We have Jesus who was taunted but still pursue God in holiness and perfection. Why would Jesus do this? It's so that in our current spiritual darkness, we would have a hope. So that even though God is hiding his face and playing peekaboo with us, and we don't have the spiritual capacity yet to understand that, we know that we have a Savior who delivered us out of that darkness And so what happens, what happens then as you're preaching the gospel to your heart, as you're putting your hope in God, you're crying out to God like a deer panting for water, what happens as you preach the gospel to yourself? I want to close with this point. Verse 7 says, Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. I'm going to read that one more time. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. So this is what's happening. When he says deep calls to deep, listen to me. You're the deep, okay? Deep calls to deep means you're the deep and you're calling out to the deep, okay? It's deep stuff, right? So listen to me. Deep calls to deep, that means you're the deep and you're calling out to the deep. That means this, okay? Um, a deep creator created a deep creation, right? A deep creator does not create shallow creation. A deep creator creates a creation with deep longings for God. A deep creation longs to re-engage with a deep creator. Do you see what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is your soul isn't satisfied with a fast food God. Your soul craves something deeper, something way more satisfying, something way more refreshing. And so if you find yourself, even now, dissatisfied with life, you're probably feasting on junk food instead of the living God, okay? I mean, let's just be honest with that. I'm not judging you. I'm not calling you out. You're probably just feasting yourself on shallow entertainment instead of the living God who actually satisfies your soul. And so... What I'm trying to point, point out from this is that as you hope in God, as you preach the gospel to yourself, something happens. Well, you find God. Okay, before you get there, something happens. In this process, as you're going through the spiritual darkness, as you're struggling, you're, you're, you're trying to preach the gospel to yourself. You suck at preaching, but you're preaching the gospel to yourself. You have to understand that there is a process. You hear that expression, trust the process? Okay, and that process creates in you a deeper hunger for God. Worship stirs more worship. Okay, as it's kind of like when you're working out, like you're just flabby, you just, you know, you, you, you're weak, but as you work out, right, and you're trying to eat more protein, what happens? You crave more protein, right? It's kind of that same thing. As you worship, you're creating a deeper hunger and thirst for God. See, there's this process that's happening here because he's talking about what? He says, uh, deep calls to deep at the roar of your what? Waterfalls. All your breakers and your what? Waves have gone over me. When was the last time he talks about water in this song? Before he talks about waterfalls, before he talks about oceans, what do you talk about? A deer pants for a living stream. Puny little, peaceful, let's eat some cheese and crackers at the stream and be peaceful and hold our hands and be nice. Oh, right, it'd be so nice, right? That's kind of what he's talking about. The deer pants for a living stream. And then what happens? In that process of preaching the gospel to himself, now he doesn't want a living stream. Now he wants the roar of the waterfall. I don't want a living stream anymore. I want the magnitude of the waterfall to overwhelm me. I don't even want the waterfall anymore. Now I want the depth of the ocean to crash over me because my hunger for God has deepened. You preach Jesus to yourself, and then what happens? You want more Jesus. But we just get stuck. I don't feel God. I don't see his face. I don't sense his presence. Video games, give it to me. Food, give it to me. 
Shallow friends, give it to me. Identity and boyfriend and girlfriends, give it to me. And then you just get more stuck. You get deeper into your darkness, wondering where the heck God is. When God is saying to you, can't you just pursue me, even a little bit, to crack open that dusty Bible of yours and just pursue me? You can't even try? And as you do that, you get hungrier and thirsty for God. When once just a little bit of itty-bitty living stream was once good for you, now you have this insatiable craving for the depths of the ocean crashing over you. Isn't that what we're saying today in the, in the graduation service? Crashing over me. What does this mean for us? My challenge to you graduates, my challenge to you covenant members, friends, newcomers, pursue God even when you don't feel like it, even when you don't feel God. This will determine how you create your next spiritual milestone. When you face seasons of darkness, when you face seasons of spiritual apathy, even if you're in that right now, seasons where you feel like God has abandoned you, I'm telling you, the gospel proclaims to you that you have a hope. And the psalm is saying, take a grasp of that hope. Instead of just being stuck and apathetic and lazy, get at it. Get that into your soul. That's what the gospel empowers us to do. He's saying, your hope is in the gospel. Nothing else will restore you in your relationship with God. Graduates, take a hold of the gospel. Let it preach to your heart even when Nothing else is doing it for you. Pray with me.